Hi, I am Victoria Lagrange, Assistant Professor of Game Narrative at Kennesaw State University. And today I'm going to talk about the players of Detroit Become Human and their individualized communal experience. Players of digital interactive fiction question and combine media. They are active, they make choices, and identify with the characters. Digital interactive fiction, or narratives that evolve in response to players' choices, place the audience at the core of its story. The spectator becomes, in a way, the creator of content. I understand interactive fiction as a story, including a branching narrative, a story world, and multiple characters, designed by an author. In this story, the author leaves multiple narrative choices to the player, who plays as one or several characters. The player can then compare their choices with those of other players. Interactive fiction is a format that works on repetition. Um, repetition of actions and choices inside the story, and then repetition of the whole story to make different choices and experience it in a unique way. However, considering the player as a single entity in interactive fiction can lead to misconceptions. On video game platforms, users can access data representing the choices made by other players. They also discuss the multiple possible narrative paths on social media, subreddit groups, Facebook groups, etc., where players ask for advice for other playthroughs. If each player gets an individualized experience catered by their choices, this experience is also paradoxically communal because of the data embedded in the game and forums dedicated to discussions about players' choices. Examples of interactive fictions include Donut Entertainment and Square Enix's Life is Strange series, uh, The Walking Dead, or all of Quantic Dreams games. My study focuses on the game Detroit Become Human, developed by Quantic Dream. I choose to focus on this game for two main reasons. It involves multiple playable characters in the narrative and includes a visible flowchart. This decision tree indicates which choices lead to which narrative path and contains users' data for each choice. The player's actions do not just affect whether the character lives or dies, but they also affect major narrative elements with more variation than any game before it. The game has proven to be highly popular. This January 2023, the studio had sold over 8 million copies. In this game set in Detroit and the year 2038, Androids are part of everyday life. They replace usual services, house cleaning, babysitting, police, even sexual work, and have all become very affordable. The game's narrative focuses on the appearance of deviant androids who have begun to feel empathy. The player makes choices for three different characters who often have contradictory goals. Kara, a deviant housekeeper android who tries to save a little girl from her abusive father on the left. Marcus, a deviant caretaker android leading the liberation movement. And Connor, a police investigator android. After each chapter of the game, a flowchart appears on the screen, which only unlocks the choices the player has made, but allows them to compare their choices with those other players or their friends on the platform have made. In the game, each of the characters can die, including player characters, and the narrative continues without their storyline, except for Connor, who is just replaced by another copy. The existing research on Detroit Become Human focuses on three main elements, its representation of contemporary issues, decision-making and morality, and empathy, including perspective-taking and empathic concern. If several studies have focused on morality and decision-making, only Palavicini considers immersion as a factor encouraging empathy in the game. Although some researchers have criticized the use of the term immersion in game studies for its confusing meaning, suggesting instead to use the term incorporation, I use the definition of immersion in relation to story transportation. Players who becomes immersed in or transported into a story world become emotionally and cognitively engaged in the story and can picture events taking place vividly. 
This is very important for decision making in interactive fiction, since through immersion, players can clearly envision the consequences of their choices in the story world. I hypothesize that interactive fiction video games increase immersion and first person identification for characters while promoting a paradoxically individualized communal experience. Because digital interactive narratives are co-constructed, they evolve depending on user choices, it is impossible to understand them entirely without focusing on the player's experience. The purpose of this presentation is to analyze how players respond to an interactive fiction video game that incites them to replay and what consequences this type of narrative has on immersion, empathy, and identification with the characters. In this study, I ask, are interactive fiction games immersive and what contributes to immersion? I hypothesize that interactive fiction games are highly immersive and that the individualized story as well as the world building and compelling characters contribute to immersion. Do players replay the game and why? I suggest that most players do replay the game to explore different narrative elements of the game. How do people make choices in interactive fiction? I conjecture that the players anticipate the outcome of their choices by referring to the context given by the fictional world that they are playing in. Do players feel empathy for all playable characters? I predict that players feel empathy for specific characters, but not necessarily balanced empathy for all of them. Can interactive fiction video games induce behavioral change? Based on the Proteus effect by Yi and Bidenson and, and the player's projection onto their avatar, I predict that interactive fiction video games can affect players' attitude shortly after finishing the game. Researchers have studied, uh, have used a variety of methods to study this game. Qualitative methods include interviews and study of the game's data. However, interviews are limited in the number of participants. Um, RM, Bide, and Al studies counts 19 participants, and Craig and Al's 18, and the reliability of the proceedings analysis. Regarding the study of the game's choice data, since there is no known information behind the treatment of the game's data in the flowchart owned by Sony, this method also has its limitation. I chose to focus on a post-experience questionnaire with aggregated scales involving both quantitative responses, participants were asked to, raise their to rate their answers um, on different scales, and qualitative responses, participants were asked to respond to questions in writing. I recruited a total of 268 participants uh, unpaid who completed the whole survey via forums dedicated to Detroit Become Human on Reddit, Facebook, as well as on my personal Twitter account. Participants could take the study only if they had played the video game Detroit Become Human. The average age of participants was 23 years old. 103 participants identified as male, 137 as female, 21 as non-binary, and seven preferring not to state their gender. Participants' location was not disclosed. Participants filled in a Qualtrics survey. They first had to answer questions pertaining to their first playthrough of the game and choice making, uh, such as how did you make your choices in your first playthrough of Detroit? And each time you made a choice, did you think about what the outcome could be? The next section focused on immersion in the game with the following questions. How strongly were you immersed in the story? Participants were then asked to rate their control over the story, empathy, and sight taking. They also had to answer questions pertaining to moral choices in the game and to the interface, some of them being open-ended questions, such as if you made an immoral choice, such as taking the bus ticket and laying or sacrificing your friend, how did you feel about that? Participants were then asked if they replayed the game. If they did, they had access to another portion of the questionnaire focused on subsequent playthroughs. All participants could then answer a series of questions pertaining to the real-life impact of the game and their enjoyment of the game. 
They then replied to a few questions regarding their demographics and their gaming and video streaming habits. If you are curious about the questions on the survey, uh, I would be excited to answer them uh, during the Q&A portion of the conference. Now let's talk about the results. The first question was, are interactive fiction games immersive and what contributes to immersion? Participants report being highly immersed in the video game. On a scale from zero to seven, where well, zero was not at all and seven was very much, participants rated their immersion in the video game at 6.49. The control they felt over the story is also high at 5.37. The high rate of immersion can be explained by the interactive nature of the narrative, rated first as the, re as the reason for enjoyment by participants, and the control they exert over it. Since there are now multiple ways in which players can experience a game, I questioned the players on their experience playing Detroit Become Human. Participants were able to select multiple answers. If most of the participants reported to having played alone, 83%, Many of them also played while their friends were watching and watched online playthroughs of the game. In the introduction, I argued that interactive fiction leads the way for an individualized communal experience. This finding may support the previous hypothesis. Players of Detroit Become Human enjoy making choices in the narrative with a community of players. 48% of players affirm having played the game with friends or having watched their friends play. The second questions I asked, the second question I asked was, do players replay the game and why? 83% of participants replayed the game five times on average. Now, why do players replay the game? I asked participants to choose all the reasons they had for replaying the game, and the results can be found in this table. Most participants reported that the main reason for replaying the game was to discover the parts they had missed from the flowchart, 71%, and to change a few key decisions that would allow them to experience a different story, 69%. Therefore, regret doesn't appear to be a key reason for replaying, while narrative exploration appears to be one. Players see on the flowchart the choices they have missed and discuss them on dedicated online forums. Additionally, players who replay the game tend to be much more involved in online communities than those who don't. There are two possible explanations for this. On the one hand, participants could have played the game, replayed it, and wanted to continue their narrative experience by joining online communities. On the other hand, it is possible that players discuss the experience they had with the game on online forums and compare the narrative they experienced to the one that other people have experienced. This could have incited them to replay, to make different choices with a focus on narrative exploration. There is a correlation, but it isn't clear at this stage if replaying causes implication in online communities or the contrary. However, this communal experience is key to users re-experiencing the games. How do people make choices in interactive fiction? Interactive fiction video games are choice-based and the choices made by the players alter their narrative experience. I asked participants to provide their reasoning behind making choices in Detroit Become Human. Questions were rated on a scale from zero to seven, while zero was not at all, and seven was very much. Participants reported making choices mostly because it corresponded to what they would do, 5.5, and because they benefited their favorite character, 4.5. However, these reasons vary widely between participants. I also show that participants tend to think about the outcome of the choices before making them, 5.67, but they feel like the predicted outcome doesn't necessarily match the actual outcome, 3.61, while still very much enjoying those choices. Players must be able to predict the outcome of the choices, but the outcome should be different than what they have predicted. You probably wonder why. Well, if I make a choice and I know exactly what is going to happen, then the story is not exciting. There is no engagement. However, if I make a choice and I am surprised by the outcome, it is not the one I had predicted, then the enjoyment is greater. 
Empathy for the characters is not necessarily one-sided, but it is not balanced. Users tend to experience more empathy for Connor in the game and less for Kara. This might be explained by the fact that Connor is one of the only characters that can or cannot become a deviant by developing empathy. Another explanation is that Connor is the only white male protagonist of the game, while Kara, the only playable female character, is mostly defined by care. She takes care of Alice. Empathy in Detroit Become Human is not balanced. Users tend to care more about one character instead of caring equally for all of them. This is important because it means that when there are multiple characters in a digital interactive fiction game, Players do not empathize with all of them equally and might use a non-preferred character as a pawn to help their favorite character, even to the point of hurting them. Finally, I was interested to see if playing an interactive fiction game has any impact on the way people envision choice making in their real life. Building on the Proteus effect, I hypothesized that it did. I asked participants a series of three questions regarding the impact the game has had on their own life. After playing Detroit, in your real life, have you felt like you could see your own choice map in your head while making important decisions? The different choices appeared more clearly to you. You wish you could have made a different choice. Participants rated each of these choices on a scale from zero to seven, zero being not at all, and seven very much. The results are mixed. While it has no impact on some participants, other participants reported influencing how they view their own choices in real life. Sorry about that. <laughs> the standard deviation is high. This effect should be studied in future research. Overall, this study has three main findings. Firstly, Detroit Become Human promotes high immersion for players. Secondly, Players experience a paradoxical individualized communal experience in which the story changes according to their choices. And they also compare their choices to those other players have made in online communities or those made by their friends, which incentivizes them to replay the game. Finally, Detroit Become Human promotes imbalanced empathy since participants show more empathy for Connor than for any of the other playable characters. In this study, I chose to use a post-experience questionnaire that I advertised on both private accounts and on social media accounts dedicated to Detroit Become Human. Since most participants came from social media accounts that focus on the video game, there is a clear bias towards the fandom. It would be interesting to reproduce a similar study that is not necessarily targeted towards the fandom to see if the results are consistent. The post-experience questionnaire, instead of a series of interviews or the study of the game's data, allowed consistency in the questions asked and high participation, which is also linked to the study being advertised in online fandoms. To my knowledge, this is the highest sample of players' responses regarding Quantic Dreams Detroit Become Human. I tried to palliate some of the known limits of post-experience surveys. I offered participants the option to choose I don't remember if they did not recollect certain elements of their gameplay. By adding open entry questions, I was also able to identify that the literacy level of participants allowed all of them to understand and participate in the questionnaire. And finally, while it is difficult to get rid of the social desirability bias, especially in the context of a fandom study where participants might want to be perceived as the best fan, I believe that the number of participants might help palliate this limitation. Additionally, since this study only focused on Quantic Dreams Detroit Become Human, it is not possible to generalize the results to all digital interactive narratives. In order to do so, one would have to perform a similar study on other story-driven games, such as like, the Life is Strange series or Telltale games. Um, by looking at the game, uh, sorry, by looking at the results for the questionnaires, across games, we would get a better understanding of players' experience in digital interactive narratives. This would help develop both our academic understanding of the field and help drive the creation of game narratives by identifying the elements that forge this individualized communal experience of digital interactive fiction. 
Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have, provide clarification, or hear your suggestions or comments when we meet. Thank you. Bye.